as was made aware, this is part two uh, of our three-part special series that, alhamdulillah, the three communities, uh, HIC, IEC, and JIC collectively work to make this happen. So we'd like to uh, thank all the management teams from those respective centers for uh, putting this event together. Uh, we'd like to thank Sayed for coming from Toronto. The, uh, I'm sure he's very much missing the blizzards and snow for this 75 degree weather. Um, special night on this inauguration night, you know, you get, all, you get everything here. Um, yeah, we, uh, th there's talk of building a wall on the north side as well, so we'll see how it goes after tonight. Um, but in any case, after, after the speech, um, as was mentioned in the IEC email, there will be uh, IEC board elections, and there will also be dinner served right here uh, in the dining hall. The elections are for uh, those who are members of the IEC community. Uh, if you're not sure of that status, uh, you can see one of the current board members, uh, Brother Hassan is here, you can get in touch with him. Um, please try loud salawat for Sayyid Asad Jafri for his family's health uh, and his success. Salawat. I don't know if you'll ever see a, a Shia speaker who looks like a former NFL or a NBA player, but uh, Alhamdulillah, Sayyid's a good guy, inshallah. Rahmallah man qara al Fatiha. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Maliki yawm al-Din. Yaqul Rabbi yaqul Salam. Salam al-Ladina anamda alayhi salam. Rabbi yaqul Salam. Say salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, please. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi al-lazhi la yablughu nidhahatuhu al-luqailun. Wa la yuhsi na'ma'ahu al-adun. Wa la yuaddi haqquhu al-mujtahidun. الذي لا يدركه بعد الحمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا والشفيع ذنوبنا سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين لا سيما بقية الله في العرضين صاحب العص والزمان خليفة الرحمن إمام الإنس والجان ولعن الله وعداهم جمعين إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يوم لا ينفع مال ولا بنون إلا من أطى الله بقلب سليم صلوا على محمد وعلى محمد As Mohsen announced tonight we have a part two of our three part series on the idea of reviving the hearts and last night we had the honor of reciting at Husseiniya for our first part Tonight, I'm honored to be here with you as well, and tomorrow, inshallah, Ja'afari will make our stop. And really, this unique three-part inter-community lecture series that has been created uh, is a beautiful sign for people like me who come from outside to see that there is dialogue, discussion, there is uh, communal work between the three centers, and it really is a little bit of a blueprint for the future, and I, I ask all of you to please continue to unite like this, work together, come together, there will always, always be differences, right? As my father-in-law often says, where there are multiple dishes, there's lots of noise. And so there's bound to be noise, and noise is okay. Ikhtilaf, a difference of opinion, is to be respected in Islam. 
And that difference of opinion, so long as it is, is, is in the mind, is bearable. When it trickles into the heart, however, becomes a little bit difficult. Let's not allow our differences of the zehn to become a qalbi discussion. Inshallah, we are able to adopt, we are able to understand the fact that working together is always more beneficial. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Last night, for those of you who were with me, and I recognize some faces from last night, alhamdulillah, we attempted to understand the topic, and this is of course a, a huge topic at hand, the qalb or the heart in Islam, and specifically the heart of a, of a salim, sahih mu'min in Islam, requires a very lengthy discussion. There are dimensions within dimension of, of, of this topic, we talk about, let's say, for example, the tarbiyat or the nurturing of the hearts, the curing of the hearts, the diagnosing of the hearts, understanding, of course, the ahmiyat and the importance of the heart to be what? To be that salvational tool on the Day of Judgment. The foundational verse that I have been reciting in yesterday's khutbah and today speaks very clearly about this. يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَا وَلَا بَنُونَ On that day, nothing will benefit you. On the day of judgment, nothing will benefit you. Your mal, your property, and your banoon, your children, will not benefit you. And I mentioned last time, these are two things that we die for. These are two things that sometimes is our motivation to get up in the morning. And here the Quran is saying, look, they're useless to you. Except for illa man atallaha biqalbin salim. Except for the one who enters Allah, presents himself to Allah, has mulaqat with Allah, has a meeting with Allah with this qalb is salim, with this heart that's free of evil, this heart that's free of any sort of distortion inside of it. Now, how do you get to that point? Given the fact that every corner we look at now, there's shayateen who are present. That's the crux of our discussion. And last night we talked a little bit about the, the idea that it really begins from within. It's a very inside-out process. We're very quick sometimes to diagnose and judge others. Even prescribe sometimes medication to them. That you know, brother, if you do this, it'll solve your problem. If you do this, you'll be okay. If you try this, this should work. And we have a prescription for almost every other individual outside of us but the person in the mirror who's screaming for some ilaj, for some treatment, we don't know where to start sometimes. And that's not going to cut it. We have to be able to do an inside-out process. And so tonight, we want to look at this idea that why is it sometimes that this heart of ours doesn't move towards Allah? What are those blockages? What are those roadblocks? Because the reality is that everybody in this room has this love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's nobody here, and I say this very with, with, with the utmost sincerity, nobody here wishes to challenge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nobody here has enmity towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everybody wishes what? For him to be ravi with us and us to be ravi with him. That's our goal. That's what we want to do. But at times, sometimes, this dunya gets the best of us. Shaitan gets the best of us. And sometimes we end up what? We end up selling ourselves short. And in the end, we go back, we repent to Allah, we beg to Allah, we have this regret. But sometimes what ends up happening is that we take, as I mentioned last night now, we take our iman for granted. We think that, you know what? This is exactly where, where, where I've been all my life. This is my childhood, I should be okay. We can't understand for a moment that maybe I might, to God forbid, become misguided. And the Quran very openly, it's a dua that I recite every day in Qunut. That Rabbana la tudhi qulubana ba'da id hadaytana. Look at the words now of this ayat. That oh Allah, do not allow zigh, do not allow this, this kasifi, this, uh, you know, this gumrahi, this misguidance to enter my heart. After you've already guided us. Meaning you've shown me the path. You gave me the proper tarbiyat. You put me in a household, mashallah, that spread the love of the Ahl Bayt. You put me in a household that talked about God, the mercy of God. And in that household, I grew. In the process, I have this heart that's geared towards you, Allah. Now I'm begging you, Allah, to what? To keep me on that path. That's why, you know, our translation of Ahdana Sarat al-Mustaqeem is not the idea of guide me to the right path. 
That's not our translation. Alhamdulillah, we believe that we are already on Salat al Mustaqim. If it is, it's a dua. Ten times a day we ask Allah, we beg Allah in our salat with the utmost level of khushu. What? That Allah keep me guided on the path of Allah. Because the reality is that shaitan won't be found in the clubs and in downtown and those areas that those are the army and the, and, and, and the arena of shaitan. Shaitan sometimes is found within these four walls. And shaitan sometimes finds his way, trickles his way into the heart of a mu'min and begins to play around, begins to come inside, move in, move around furniture, all of a sudden now makes it his place and to the point you can't recognize yourself sometimes. And after a while what ends up happening is, is, is this dunya does what? It eats away at you, it pricks away at you, it pulls at you. It gives you every hardship, every trouble, one after one after one to the point where our heart becomes hardened. We become a little bit hopeless. We say things like, Allah, I've been begging you for this dua for the past year, two years, three years. Nothing's being done. On the nights of Qadr, in the nights of Sha'aban, in the first days of Muharram, in Karbala, in Najaf, here in Orlando, whatever the case may be, I've begged you, I've begged you, I've begged you. I see nothing on the apparent being done, so my heart begin, be, begins to flutter a little bit begins to doubt a little bit and we begin to lose our patience and in losing our patience our heart then begins to kind of sway from that sirat al-mustaqim that we beg Allah to keep me on every single day and we have moments where what? where we come, you know we refer to it as shirki language sometimes in a hawza we begin to challenge Allah and the only time that we challenge Allah is when this dunya and inside of us things become a little bit difficult. You know, the example I'll give you is a very simple one. That of a pool, a swimming pool. If the water in the pool is completely still, it becomes very difficult for you to understand how dirty the pool is. Because once the water settles, the dirt settles to the, to the bottom of the pool. The moment that you jump in and the waves begin to crash each other, the water begins to move, slowly but surely you begin to realize that this pool that I thought was clean is very much dirty right now. So long as our life is still and things are going smooth, everything is going well, we ourselves don't know what exists inside of our hearts. The moment this dunya throws a little bit of a wave at us, the moment hardships come, we begin to crash from left to right, then we end up saying things that we would never say six months ago. And what resided in the heart of our hearts begins to come to the top. And that's when we say things like, how could you take my husband away from me when all I've done is serve your community? How could you take my javan, my young son away when all I did was do khidmat and serve your, your deen? This is a challenge of Allah, of course. So we become a little bit patient. And tonight, in the very first discussion, I want to share with you a very beautiful tradition by Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, alayhi salatu wasalam. It's a tradition of hope. It's one that really makes us understand and realize that we're not alone in this battle. He says... Inna subirun. It's a very beautiful tradition and one that I, inshallah, if Allah gives me power, I can explain properly. He says, we the Ahl Bayt are not patient, he says. He says, we are very patient. Subirun is different from sabr, right? There's sabr, there's sabr, there's subar, right? It's called sirim mubalagha in the world of Arabic grammar. One is patience, one is very patient, right? Sajda, sajid, sajjad. Right? Sajid is one who does sajda. Sajjad is one who does what? A lot of sajda. Right? We call him Imam Sajjad because he was continuously in the art of prostration. Inna subirun, he says, Imam Sadiq, we are very patient. Wa shi'atuna asburun minna, ajib. And our shi'as are more patient than us. If he said this to us, we would say, are you sure about that? 
And the hadith says that there was a companion right this time and says, how is this possible, Ya Rasulullah? How could you say that we or the Shias are more patient than you? And then he explains in a very beautiful statement. He says, he says, Nasburu alama na'alamu wa shi'atuna yasburuna alama la ya'lamu. Oh, it's beautiful. He says, we are patient because we have the knowledge of what will follow our patience. But our Shi'as, they're patient even though sometimes they have no idea what will happen after their patience. Let me give you a simple example. My parents in the audience who have young daughters or young sons, and when they reach a certain age, you start to worry about their marriage and their future, especially if you have daughters. It's a legit concern. You want to make sure that you find a good guy, a little bit of the bold dunya and deen, religious, educated, good family. Now, there are some people who are very concerned about this. And some mothers, for example, have daughters at home who the daughter's friends now one by one are getting married, one by one are getting engaged, their cousins, their sisters, everybody. But she, for some reason, things aren't really happening. So naturally, the mother becomes a little bit concerned. Du'as, a'mal, all these things, trips to ziyarat, asking people. And then there comes a moment where somebody calls this mother and says, look, I have a very nice boy for you, let's say in England. He's educated, good family, I know them very well. They introduce these two together, they begin talking, and for some reason it doesn't work out. Sometimes it doesn't work out. And for a moment now, the mother of this daughter has a little bit of hope, a little bit of hope. That, okay, they're talking, maybe this is the guy, maybe this is my son-in-law. But for some reason, things don't work out. It happens sometimes. Now, you go back to the mother, you go back to the daughter, you give them some advice. What do you say? You tell her what? Be patient. Be patient. The right guy will come across, will come along. Don't worry. Your son-in-law, your husband, inshallah, will be a great guy. This was maybe not the guy for you. And you're, you're told, as the mother and the daughter, to be patient. You have no idea tomorrow what will happen, or the next day what will happen, or next month what will happen, but you're told to be patient. And in the beauty of patience, you're patient. In the beauty of patience, you're patient. That patience is what Imam Salak is talking about. It doesn't mean, it's not a literal comparison. We're not saying that, God forbid, that what we are going through is more difficult than what Rasulullah went through. What went through. Of course not. Nor are we saying that what we, we, what we are going through, Imam Ali didn't go through. No. What here Imam Sadiq is saying, now this is your leader, your Imam, your Wali, your Hadi. He's saying, look, I get it. I understand I know that sometimes getting through 24 hours right now for you is very difficult. There are some of you in this world, in, in this room right now, who are struggling, who are quietly suffering inside of you. You come into this room, you come into this building with a beautiful smile on your face, mashallah. But inside, what, what, what's going on, only Allah knows. And yet, what do you do with a brave face, a patient face? You leave your house, you get dressed, you meet people, they have no idea what's happening inside of you. You smile, you greet, hello, how are you, ahwal, everything. Meanwhile, inside you're dying. The dunya's walls are closing in. You go on your masala, you cry to Allah. The next morning you wake up with this patience and you move forward with your day. That patience Imam Sadiq is talking about. It's such a beautiful tradition when your imam is telling you, look, we get it. We, we understand that for a Shia in this world is very difficult. For a man of God in this world is very difficult. When it seems like, and there's a whole discussion in philosophy called the death of God inside of society. You know, the example I'll give you is a very simple one. I'll, I'll, I'll use a personal example of mine if you don't mind. This is day two, right? We know each other not very well, alhamdulillah. My father, Marhum, was a great man. And one that I found myself trying to always earn his respect. And I specifically remember, and you know, we, we come from a very, you know, traditional South Asian background. My parents are from Pakistan. And, you know, and those of you who have immigrant parents, you know that they weren't really raised as affectionate children, so there won't be affectionate parents, which is fine. You know, the hugging, the kissing, the high-fiving, we won't really get from Baba and Mama, right? 
So the few times that they would show affection to us, maybe a hug, a pat on the back, maybe a, a high five, a handshake, we remember with delights. My father was a loving man, right? He wasn't a hugger, he wasn't a kisser, but he was a man who would show you that he had a lot of respect for you. I remember the one time after my high school graduation, and I went to high school in Toronto, and the graduation was there, and the diploma was there, and I came home, and I go, look, Dad, I got my high school diploma. He shook my hand, he patted me on the shoulder, he goes, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of you, son. I remember one day going to the center, it was only me and him, and I told him, I go, Dad, do you realize how difficult it is to go through four years of high school in this part of the world? Do you know the pressures that we have? Do you know how many things are, 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 are presented to us to get off the path? And then that conversation we had, the 20-minute conversation we had, is still engraved in my, in my mind. He says, of course I get it. I know that the fact that you've gone through four years of high school without being a drug addict, without being a criminal, without being a father, without being an alcoholic, Without being, and I'm not doing tarif of myself, I'm saying this is what he was saying. Without any of this for four years, is actually very, very commendable. Meaning he was telling me in his own words that I get it. For the past four years, you worked hard and I get it. And that's my father. This is Imam Sadiq telling you that while we are patient, our Shias are more patient than us. It makes things a little bit more bearable in this world. When the people you're trying to emulate, when the people you're trying to, to, to love, when the people you're trying to imitate tell you that, look, I know that every hour in this world right now is hard for you. We get it. We are beside you. We are with you. And you will get through this. And these are the types of hadith that we need to get through it. Sometimes our heart are victims to this dunya. Because this dunya won't leave you alone. Oftentimes, my youth ask us, you know, when will shaitan stop whispering to me? I said, never. He won't. Ask my elders in the audience. His job, his promise to Allah is what? Waswasa on the path of yours. I'll come at those who believe in you from every which side. The problem is that sometimes we are waiting. We are waiting for those days that we are problem-free and carefree. And the idea is not to wait to be problem-free. The idea is to ensure that your iman doesn't shake during that problem. One man approaches Amir al-Mu'maneen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salatu wasalam. Another beautiful tradition. Comes to Imam Ali, begins to complain. Says, Amir al I'm living a very stressful life right now. My job, my health, my family, everything. Begins to complain to our first imam. And our first imam listens. When he is done, he says, Inshallah, I'll pray for you. Now, can you imagine for a moment that our imam right now is present? We're sitting across from him for 15 minutes. We're able to empty our heart onto our imam. And he's listening to us. At the end of all, all of that, he says to us that I will pray for you. Should be enough for us. Saying that's it, that's gold, I'll take it. The man leaves and one week later he comes back to Amida Mu'mineen and says that things have gotten worse. Those problems from a week ago are still there. Now one, two, three more have been added these past seven days. And begins to complain and complain and complain to the point where the hadith says, Amir al becomes a little bit bothered and says, look, you're expecting from this dunya what it cannot give you. Instead of begging for a problem-free, stress-free life, beg that while you go through those problems, your iman is stable. That's the trick. That's the solution. It's not to wait for moments of relief. I don't mean to be depressing here, but those moments of relief will happen, inshallah, in the hereafter for all of you. In this dunya, specifically for a moment and a believer, it's a prison. Not that we're supposed to live in our life boohoo in the corner. No, of course not. But the idea is to make sure that this dunya doesn't come and rock the base of our iman, that we work so hard 
to fortify and strengthen. The idea is not to beg for a carefree world. The idea is to make sure our my iman is strong enough to get through that problem. Otherwise, what ends up happening is if we let it, this dunya will come, attack our heart, and begin to flip that heart on its head. How many times have we had individuals who were on the path? Their heart was in, in the right spot, surrounded by the right people, and they end up making a wrong turn. There's a man, you know, during the time of Imam Hussein, the Hakim Mashraqi, it's a very famous story. When news spread out that Imam Hussein was leaving Medina and Mecca to go towards Kufa, he would approach certain people that he would meet, asking them, are you going to, are you going to come with me towards Kufa? Now there are some people, of course, who would, you know, who would avoid Imam Hussein. Right? If you ask me, I say, no, it looks bad on me. They would cross the street if he was coming his way. They would avoid eye, avoid eye contact. Dahak was approached by Imam Hussein, and Imam Hussein said, look, Dahak, you heard I'm going to Kufa, right? He goes, yes, I heard. He goes, are you, you going to come with me? He's like, well, look at the way Dahak now talks to Imam Hussein. He goes, you know, I'll, I'll make you a deal, Imam Hussein. I'll come with you to Kufa, but the moment that I feel, the moment that I feel that my life will be in danger, I want the freedom to come back to Medina and Mecca. So there's no problem. Right? A conditional companion, as we call it, right? A conditional as, as long as things are glorious, la ya imam. This man travels very carefully now, please, with me. This man travels on the 28th of Rajab from Medina all the way to Karbala, second of Muharram. A long journey. Okay, walking with the Imam, talking with the Imam, sleeping with the Imam, praying behind the Imam, eating with the Imam, right? Listening to the Imam. Those of you who have traveled in, in Hajj and Ziyad with people that you know, your community, you get to know people in travel, good or bad. You get to understand how people truly are. This man had the honor of traveling with Imam Hussein in this long, drawn out journey. They arrive in Karbala, the second of Muharram, the fourth of Muharram, the sixth of Muharram. On the 8th of Muharram, Dahak approaches Imam Hussein. By then now, thousands are coming from Kufa, right? On Yazid's army, and there is a handful of those in Imam Hussein's army. He says, Imam Hussein, I want to remind you of the deal that you and I had. And that deal is what? That the moment that I think that my life will be in danger, Allahumma salli ala It's okay, kids are supposed to cry. If kids don't cry, who will cry? Inshallah. If one of you stood up and started crying, I'd be concerned. But inshallah, a two-year-old, it's okay. Let her cry. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. On the 8th of Muharram, he says to Imam Hussein, I'm here to cash in on my deal with you. There's 30,000 on one side, and you have maybe at the most 100 people. Doesn't look good for you. Imam Hussein says, no problem. I'm not going to force anybody. But I don't have a horse for you to get back. I have no mode of transportation for you to get back to Medina. He goes, don't worry, Imam, don't worry, don't worry. I stashed my horse away down the street, just in case. This man goes down the road, climbs on his horse, and makes his way back to Medina. He was two days away, two days away from being included in the Ashab of Abba Abdullah al Hussein of Ashura. Those ashab that every Thursday we say salams to, that no other imam, no other prophet had, he could have been on that list. But because a little bit of a fear of what? Life, hunger, thirst, he left. This was a man who traveled with Imam Hussein for days and days and days. You would think his heart would turn towards the fact that in every situation, I say labeg to you. But no, all he could see was the dunya. And this happens sometimes. So the first thing I want to mention tonight is the idea that we're not going to allow, easier said than done, I get it, not going to allow the troubles and the rubble of this dunya to play with our hearts. Nor are we going to be delusional to think that one day, someday, this dunya will leave me alone. No. Think about Imam Sadiq. Was Shiatuna asparu minna? And my Shias are more patient than we are. 
right? If you can get through your, strugg your, your struggles and your difficulties with this hadith, inshallah, then we are successful. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Point number two. <clears throat> Our Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala He gives some advice to Abadhar, a very famous companion and a very famous piece of advice. He says that whatever you do in your life, attach a niyat, an attention to it. Don't do things aimlessly. Even sleeping, even walking, even changing your clothes, everything. And when the ulama do a commentary of this one line that he gives Abu Dhar, they come across a very beautiful discussion on Tawheed. Inshallah, you'll follow me. We have reduced Tawheed to mean La ilaha illallah, a verbal expression alone. When in reality, Tawheed is a verb. It requires action. It's a lifestyle. We're, we have to live Tawheed, not verbally express Tawheed. How do we do that? I'll give you a very simple example. People like me, we live multiple lives. And we have multiple masks that we put on our face. Okay? I come to the mosque, I come through those doors, I put on my IEC mask. And with that mask, I have certain libas, I have certain clothing, certain akhlaq, certain salam, certain smiles, everything. When I leave IEC, I go home, I take off the IEC mask, I put on my family mask. With my wife and my kids, how am I? I'm different, I have different libas on, I have different akhlaq on, I have different behavior on. When I leave my family, I go to work, I have my work mask on. Different clothing, different akhlaq, different behavior, everything. When I'm by myself in my room at 2 o'clock in the morning, I have my alone mask on. Different libas, different behavior, different akhlaq. On social media, I have a social media mask on. We're different in social media, right? Yeah. If I was to, you know, if I was to follow any of you on, on Facebook and Twitter, I might be shocked to see what you guys post and what you guys ret retweet. That's your social media mask. When you're with your friends, it's a certain mask. And we end up doing what? People like me, we end up living multiple lives with multiple masks on our face. Sometimes we have this dripping akhlaq of sweetness inside the mosque, inside, at work, with John and Henry and Frank. But inside the mosque sometimes, with Ali, Hussein and Hassan, we are the worst of people. Sometimes in the mosque, we are the best of mu'mineen. At home, we are the dhalimeen, unfortunately. Sometimes on social media, we think nobody's watching us, so we post things we shouldn't post. But in front of individuals, we, pre we, we present a different mask. And so what ends up happening is we live multiple lives with multiple masks on. And then we say, La ilaha illallah. Remember, the statement of La ilaha illallah, <laughs> it's amazing. It's first negation, then acceptance, correct? It's first la ila, la ila, la ila. Once we remove every ila, every god with a small g inside of my heart, one by one, every mask is gone one by one. What's left is illallah, one mask of Allah. Meaning what? That no matter where I am, what I'm doing, online, offline, in the mosque, at work, at home, with my wife, alone in my bedroom, I have one mask. That mask is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a lifelong process to do. It shouldn't be that if I one day pop up at your school and see how you are, I'd be shocked. It's not to the point where one day if I stalk you on social media, and I just might stalk some of you on social media, I'd be shocked to see what your Facebook status is. It shouldn't be that your wife should complain to people like me that Malana, he puts on a great show in the mosque, but he comes home and he's made my life a living hell. It should be that no matter where you are, with who you are, you know that Allah is hadir and nadir. He's present and he's watching. And this harmonization of all of our path into one is the essence of Tawheed. 
That's the essence of Tawheed. To not place Allah, physically place Allah in four walls. To know that the same Allah that you pray to on this farsh in front of the community is the same Allah you pray to behind closed doors in your room by yourself. Because what ends up happening is that as we have different masks on and different lives on, our heart begins to flutter. Our heart begins to move from one mass to another mass to another mass. It has no idea what's going on. And the sheer idea that you might be misguided becomes a more of a reality because you're not focused on your path. It's very difficult. It's very hard to do that. It's very hard to do anything with Allah inside of it. One of the ways that we can purify our hearts is to, to, to ask myself, whatever I'm doing right now, be it sitting right now listening to me, be it driving home, be it a nine to five, be it a one hour of basketball, be it watching, let's say, the game on Sunday, be it watching today's inauguration, whatever the case may be, whatever you are doing, ask yourself, is there God in here or not? If you can't find God in everything that you do, then question why am I doing it? You know, we, we sometimes harp on the idea that we need to live a balanced life, a balanced life, a balanced life. Right? And our youth don't understand what that means. How much of the dunya can I invest in, Sayyid? And how much of the akhirat can I invest in? How much can I enjoy this dunya without ruining my akhirat? And how much do I live for the akhirat in the dunya? How much fear should I have? How much hope should I have? Should I be so fearful of Allah that one sin and that's it? I'm held down for sure? Or so delusional that I think every single sin of mine will be forgiven? That sin go crazy, Allah will forgive me. This balancing act for our kids, our youth, is a very difficult thing, especially in this part of the world. Part of the idea of balancing is making sure that everything that you do is hovered and covered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you are leaving every morning and your commute to work is to provide for your family because as husbands and fathers, it's wajib on us to do that and you're fulfilling that wajibat, then every mile you drive to work is fi sabilillah. If spending one hour with your child on the ground coloring in a coloring book and she gets happy by doing that, then that one hour in pleasing your child is fi sabilillah. If you're inviting a few brothers over to watch the big game on Sunday and watch the Packers beat uh, the Falcons, and you're doing it for unity purposes, brotherhood, cultivate some love, you're doing that fi sabilillah. If you come home and you speak to your wife for half an hour to 45 minutes because she has been home all day, you've been out all day. And she's been dying for some adult conversation. And you sit there and you listen to her. That conversation is fisa bilillah. It all depends on why you're doing it. It all depends on if you can find God in that act that you're doing. And this idea is the harmonization of all of our life into the path of Allah. We've reduced Allah to, the, to be these works, the, the, these, these acts of ibadat that are ma'aruf shudeh, as they say. Salat and salm and khums and hajj is only... No, worship can be, like I said, one hour of coloring with your child. You know, it's amazing. All these things bring us joy. I know as a father, it brings me joy when I play with my child. And she laughs and she enjoys Baba's time. And what we don't realize is sometimes that when we are happy, we please Allah in the process. When we please Allah, we please ourselves. I'll give you a very simple example. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Sometimes, you know, this... Uh, this dunya and this world, it, it, it causes us to begin to hate ourselves, question ourselves, talk down to ourselves. 
And we often wonder, what is the cure? How can I, how can I build myself back inside of me? There's a, whole, there's a whole discussion that we've had several times between self-worth and self-worship. Right? Between what's called in, in, in Farsi, you know, this idea of, you know, khud parasti and khud pasandi. Right? Islam promotes the idea of having self-worth. Islam does not promote the idea of self-worshipping. But the line is so thin sometimes that we can't go either way, so we leave both of them. We don't worship ourselves, we find ourselves worthless at the exact same time. What's the solution? Sometimes, you know, we find that in, in, inside of our children. I don't know how many of you here have small kids. I know some of you do. I have small children. I have a three-year-old. And sometimes my three-year-old will do something and she'll look at me for a reaction. She'll make a funny face. She'll say, Baba, look, Baba, look, Baba, look. And she'll say, Baba, look 40 times a day. And she'll say, okay, is, is, is Baba interested? Are his eyes lighting up? If she makes a face and Baba reacts, and I laugh with her, she'll make that face for 51 times in a row. And so long as Baba is laughing, she'll laugh with me. And she's cackling. She's on the floor. She's going crazy. Why? Because Baba's happy. I did something to make Baba happy. And in the process of making my father happy, I became happy myself. In the process of making my father happy, I became happy myself. I found my personal happiness in the happiness of him. We take that to Allah. Sometimes the biggest cure for us in this self-worth game, harmonizing our life, is finding happiness in Allah. In turn, we don't even realize it sometimes. We're finding happiness within ourselves. We do things to please Allah. Sometimes the most difficult acts. You know, in the month of Ramadan right now in Toronto, it's in the summertime, we are fasting for 18 hours right now. Al-Mujahid fi sabilillah, as they say. And as difficult as it is for our 14, 15 year olds, they often tell me the moment that date and that kajur goes down my throat, and the moment that first sip of water goes down my throat, I feel like I've accomplished something. And they oftentimes ask us, what is this feeling I have? That feeling is the fact that you know that whenever you had a moment to eat something and drink something, you fought that nafs of yours for Allah. In the end, you pleased Allah. When you please Allah, this sense of accomplishment comes inside of you. We're searching for others. We're searching for others to come rescue me, come help me, come once again build my worth. Allah says, look, you want to build yourself? Build me. You want to please yourself? Please me. You please me, I will reflect that back, back onto yourself. Imam Hussein sacrifice upon sacrifice to the point where Allah says, look, that's enough. <inaudible> Come back now. Come back to the state where you are happy with me and I am happy with you. And this mutual worth that we have between us and Allah has to be found. That's why Imam Ali says that you are not a simple entity. What exists inside of you is an entire universe. It's an alam akbar. The sickness is inside of you. The cure is also inside of you. We recognize that we are sick. We look here and there for the cure. Meanwhile, we're saying inside the cure is there. What's that cure? Go and please Allah. In the happiness of Allah, you'll find your own happiness as well. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So in our discussion tonight, as a recap, we are trying to understand why is it sometimes that our heart sways, and how can we avoid that? The very first thing is the concept of patience, and not your normal patient discussion, that hadith that I relayed for you from Imam Jafar so I think it's to be reminded once in a while, when he flat out says that we understand how difficult life is in this world for our mu'mineen. And point number two is a harmonization of your life, of our, all of our lives. I'm with you. The struggle for me is every single day. It's to find God in everything that you do. To make sure that we don't have eight to ten different masks. I ask you right now, think about it. How many masks do I have? 
If the person beside me saw me at work, would he recognize me? If the person at work saw me in the, in the mosque, would he recognize me? Do we have this idea of one mask and a harmonization of our life? So with these two things, inshallah, we can begin to do what? We, we, we can begin to prepare our hearts for the coming of our Imam, inshallah. We ask you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that this life is a journey, a difficult one at that. We ask you, Allah, to inspire us, give us tawfiq, to always stay on this path of sirat al-mustaqim, inshallah. We ask you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to, to forgive our sins and help us with not repeating those sins over and over again. We ask you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the hearts of our youth, to convert the pleasure of sin to the pleasure of worship, inshallah. We ask you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are so many enemies of Islam today. We ask you, Allah, to weaken the hands of the enemies of Islam and to strengthen those mustazafin all of the world who are fighting in the fight in the front lines. We ask you, Allah, and finally we ask you, we beg you, Allah, that in our lifetime, allow us to witness the zuhur of our imam and to be as ashab when he comes, inshallah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I've been, I've been asked to open the floor for any questions, if you have any questions for this topic. If you don't have questions for me, I can ask all of you, inshallah, some questions. About tonight's speech, so you should be worried. Yeah, the floor is open. Any questions at all? If not, then inshallah, it's about to do. MashaAllah. Yes, brother. It's a great question. The question is that uh, I had mentioned I have a three-year-old and um, any, any, any suggestions on raising them in an Islamic manner? I was hoping that you could give me some suggestions actually. But um, the one thing that I will tell you, uh, and there's it, it a lot to say, is that it, it really takes a village to raise a child nowadays. And the more help that we can get from our community, from our family, uh, the better it is. So I would always ask you to get your child attached to the center, your local center, some center in your city. Whether you agree or not with that place, whether you have issues with that place, I mean, what they gain from here, of course, is the Qur'an, is Allah, is Salat, and this sense of community. One thing I want to mention is this idea, you know, we have this internal need to always feel like we belong to something. We have a very tribal fitrat inside of us. You know, we look for people who are like us and we attach ourselves to that. If we're not able to provide that environment where our kids feel like they belong to a community, they'll create their own community outside of this building. And th at that moment then you'll lose control. Right? right? Who they are with, uh, uh, where they are, it's completely out of your control. So number one, accept the fact that it takes a village to raise one child in nowadays. The era, of course, is changing, right? So bring your child as much as you can to the child. You know, he cries a lot, he sleeps a lot, he vomits, he does this, that's fine. You know, just put forth the effort a little bit, and you'll see that they'll develop this love for the deen and for the community as well, inshallah. That's a quick, quick answer. Sorry, brother. Yeah. Yes, my sister, yes. How do we work to accept our hearts? Sorry? Yeah, uh, it's, it's a great question. How do we make our hearts, um, sorry, ready for that change, sister? Um, so the question is, how do we make our hearts ready for that change? I think we are ready for that change. I think that um, the, the, the reality is that 
that nobody here, at least nobody should ever feel comfortable with the level of iman that they have. Um, you know, it, it, there's a discussion called spiritual complacency, right? The idea that we become comfortable in our spiritual zone. We actually convince ourselves that the amount that I do is enough and is good enough. Meaning that, you know, I'll, I'll get to the promised land based on what I do right now. And so when you convince yourself that what I do is enough, then of course any thought, any, any talk of islah and reform and moving forward goes, goes in one year out the other. I think the, the, the biggest thing that you can do to ensure that your heart is ready for a change is muhasaba, is accountability. Um, you know, we, you know we, we sometimes account for everything. We account for every dollar spent. We account for every liter of gas. We account for every mile that we drive. We even account for every calorie that we eat sometimes. But when it comes to our own you know, our own life, our own sins, the good things, the bad things, we don't have much of accounting there. Right? The hadith says what? To account for yourself before someone else's, else accounts for you. Right? So it, and I don't mean to sit down with a spreadsheet, Excel, no, I'm saying in your mind, at night, before you sit down, thought, stop and ask, where did I go wrong? You know? The whole discussion in Imam Khomeini's chair hadith on musharata, muraqaba, muhasiba. It's a beautiful discussion. Right? And part of that is to account for yourself. You know, how do you see your deeds? You know, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq has a beautiful hadith. He says, one of the avenues of Allah's ubudiyat, subservience to Him, is to recognize the relationship you have between you and your amal and your deeds. Right? There are some people here who don't accept the fact that I've done any good in my life. There are some people who think that I've only done good in my life. There are some people who take the smallest little good, little good deed and blow it up on social media. There are those who have done the smallest little bit of evil and have killed themselves over it. And it goes back to a balance. Right? But what should not come about is this idea that, yeah, you know what? I'm good to go. I'm for sure jannati. And you stamp a heaven on your, on, on your forehead. Right? If that happens, it becomes very difficult. So you have to be able to do what? Do a little bit of muhasaba. Once you account for yourself, you realize that I have limitations. And when you become tolerant to your limitations, you become tolerant to other people's limitations. If you believe that you are the best and the ultimate and the greatest, and everyone else in front of you is lower than you, and that's when problems start. When the chest comes out and you're walking two feet above the ground. That's a little bit of a problem, right? Sometimes it requires us to come crashing to the ground. And sometimes this dunya does that. It slaps us across and it says, look, get your act together. You're nobody. And we take that either as motivation to go good or motivation to become hopeless. So before anyone else does that, we do that for ourselves. Right? That's why Imam Sajjad says that if somebody, look at, the, look at this, if somebody praises me, he begs to Allah, if somebody praises me Allah on the outside, Lower me that much on the inside. That's beautiful. To maintain that balance. Inshallah. Anything else? No? Thank you very much. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.